Real short and sweet, good evening. As many of you know, uh, Interim Commissioner Davis is across the street at City Hall and Council Chambers doing his confirmation hearing, as are a lot of the advocates who were scheduled to be here this evening. However, because you were kind enough and patient enough to join us this evening here at the War Memorial Building, I would like to turn the microphone over to uh, Mayor Stephanie Rawlings-Blake as she gives brief remarks. So won't you please put your hands together and welcome our Mayor, Mayor Thank Stephanie Rawlings-Blake. Thank you very much, guys. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank you for being here. I know that we are double, triple, quadruple booked this evening, and I, I want to thank you for making time to stop over here. I want to thank our vendors, our uh, supporters who are out there. I was incredibly impressed with the resources and opportunities that were out there. Was anybody else impressed with what you saw out there? We can clap for that. I got to do a, a light painting and learn about uh, the uh, coding opportunities and robotics and you know we have a lot going on in Baltimore City so I want to thank all of our partners who participated in sharing information. I get so frustrated when I hear people say well there's nothing going on in the city. Yes there is. We have incredible people who are doing uh, wonderful work all throughout the city. They just need to get more exposure. And I hope that if you saw something this evening that you like, that you take a second, put it on Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or what else am I missing? Anything? You still on MySpace? Put it on MySpace. <laughs> that was a joke, that was a joke. For the young people here, MySpace was something that existed a long, long time ago. No. But no, just please share the information, I mean, because that's how we're going to uh, get it out. And um, you know, I know that the, the, the vendors that were out there, the presenters that were out there, would certainly appreciate the support. I want to thank you uh, again for being here. And this is going to be very, very brief, because I know that many of you want to uh, get out and uh, also and continue to engage with the uh, vendors. I am going to put one person on the spot, and uh, that is our Fire Chief, uh, Niles Ford. I'm going to ask you to come up and talk about your outreach efforts. I've, in my entire life, I've never seen a Fire Chief do as much as Chief Ford has done to try to encourage Baltimore City residents to join uh, the fire service and to uh, to to get a career or to to earn a career in fire service and I would love uh, fire uh, chief if you would speak a little bit about your efforts. Come on up here. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, but this this actually dates back to when when the mayor hired me and I tell people this all the time because this is factual. Her and I sat down at the big table and it was part of an interview process and it felt more like a conversation because what her commitment was, was to increase, one of, the, one of the strategic plans she has, and I'll never forget it because I read through all of them, was to increase Baltimore City by 10,000 families. And one of the things she said, one of the best ways we can do that, Chief, is offer opportunity for people that are here now. So my, my task from her was to find ways to recruit people into the fire department. So what we've done recently, um, we, had, we had a process that actually just closed, uh, interviewing process, and we had people literally, uh, we had our recruit committees standing on the street with signs telling people that, that the fire department's hiring, apply, put placards on the side of the truck. Of course, we use the social media, but I'm going to tell you something. You can't beat hand to hand when you go out and touch somebody's hand. And, and um, I mean, I, I literally had um, people in our department, our, root, our recruit team that would drive down, and you'd have a group of guys standing together, and one of the guys would jump out the truck and say, we're hiring, and, and give them information about it. And they'll, you know, these guys, first they're standoffish wondering, you know, we're in uniform, so they don't know why we're stopping. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to encourage people to be a part of our organization. We also have school programs, and that was another initiation based upon our conversation when I was hired, that we have, um, we have schools, uh, we have programs in two schools. And uh, we just started them approximately a little bit more than a year ago. 
And I need to tell you that we're in the process of hiring our first four people out of that group. Now that sounds, yeah, it, it, sound, it sounds like a small step, but it's huge for us because what it gives us an opportunity to do is put uniforms on these young people after we get them trained and get them out in the field. And we're starting them at a lower level to bring them into the system that we're able to send them back to these schools. And, and they're able to be uh, mentors and, and just a guiding light for the other young people to say, you can do this too. So the, the most important, one of the things I learned by dealing with these young people, Madam Mayor, is that we have some amazing, amazing, intelligent uh, pe young people with high integrity who want to do a good job, who want a, an opportunity, and actually want to get back to the community. So that's, that's where we are, and those are the things we've been working on. And I just want to thank you for the opportunity to do it. Thank you so much, Chief. So again, I know that, um, as, as I mentioned, there's so much going on. I want to thank our youth commissioners who are here. Uh, thank you for your leadership. You know, every time I think about it, we can clap for the youth commissioners. When I think about uh, the future, I know that the youth commissioners will be a part of it uh, because, you know, when I became interested in public service, I was in elementary school, and I worked to put myself in every position that I could to advance uh, myself so I would be prepared uh, for public service, and that's what you're doing uh, by being a part of the youth commission. So I really commend you for your level of engagement. You certainly serve as role models in the community, and I hope you don't forget that because we certainly need more role models that are engaged in the community and understand that you have something to offer. Uh, in the community, so thank you very much. And with that, did you want to say anything? Are you on the down? Are you just hanging out? <laughs> you're hanging out. All right. So you, you're going to fill the seat until the commissioner gets here. Sure All right. So with that, if any, I mean, this is very informal, and we, you know, we don't have to be serious. It's after seven, I think. Um, if anybody has any uh, questions, concern, come on up to the mic, sir. Good evening, Ms. Mayor, Stephanie Wallen Blake. I'm speaking, first to thank first, my name is Lenny Lyles. I'm speaking on the behalf of our young generation, as well as our children. First thing first, our children, our young people, they are our bright future, our bright future. City need to do a better job to invest in our young people as well as our community. First thing first, when it comes to the swimming pools, our taxpayers, we pay for that. When I was growing up, we never have to pay any money to enter into a public park pool. That should always be free. I ran into a young man about a couple years ago at Clifton Park Pool, and he said, sir, why does this city charge people money to go into a park pool? He was from Philadelphia, and I said, well, I've been trying to call down City Hall consistently and talk to the city councilman and the mayor's office that they need to eradicate the admission price so our young people don't have to come out their pockets and pay money to go into a city park pool. Secondly, when it comes to the African Heritage Festival, I understand the city had turned that over to a private um, enterprise. We always had three days event, Friday to Sunday, Kusana African Heritage Festival. We had our children as well as our young people participate during the open ceremony when it comes to marching band. That's our children and young people outlet when it comes to music marching. I strongly believe that the city needs to get back to basic so we can get back three days, our three days back concerning our African Heritage Festival. It's no excuse, no justification why we can't have our three days when it comes to the art skate and when it comes to the book festival. They had three days concerning the festival. So you have some things that you need to catch up on before you leave office. 
you have an opportunity to get some things right before you leave office. You always talk about, I'm going to get back to what I was saying earlier, about our, our young people. They are our future. But you always do the opposite. Your responsibility is to serve the people, to serve all citizens who live in this city, not part here, not part there. You have a great responsibility to say what you mean and mean what you say when it comes to the future, our bright future, when it comes to our young people. Your responsibility is to serve the people, not to take away from the people. To serve the people, that means to help the people, not take away. The late William Donald Schaefer said it right, what I just said, he said the same thing. All y'all do is take from the people. Again, you both to serve the people with dignity and with respect, not to take from the people. So the city government have a long way to go. We have our problem, just like other cities. But I'm talking about my city that I grew up in, and I'm a taxpayer as well, too. And I used to be a former city employee as well. So again, Ms. Mayor, you have an opportunity to get little, some, some little things done right before you leave office. You must serve the people, not take away from the people. We have the white power structure that is that's oppressing our young people. Now, when it comes to the rise that is, like Dr. King said, the risers are the voice of the unheard. Y'all continue to neglect and reject the young people. We all have rights. Thank you. Thank Mr. you for Brown. your time and thank you for your time for listening. And y'all have a great evening. Thank you very much, Mr. Lyles, for, for uh, coming out. Um, I don't really know where to start. Um, well, first I'll, st I'll start with with the thank you. Uh, where did you go? There you are. Um, I'll start with the with the pools. Um, we've I've worked very hard to ensure that we have a quality we have quality aquatics uh, programs uh, in place for Baltimore City residents. And uh, while there was a time when we uh, charged for a lot of the things that we provided for the young people. One thing I was extremely proud of is that uh, we've been able to make the summer camps programs. We had summer camps at 31 recreation centers that were absolutely free uh, for for uh, students and when I for you know for kids. And when I say that, I say that because every, far too often I think people say, "Well, uh, you know, when I was growing up, this is how it was." There's nothing that is the same as when we were growing up. Um, whatever you were paying for, for gas when you were growing up, it's not the same. It's not wrong. It's, it is the progression of time. And we can adapt or we can, we can choose not to adapt. It doesn't change the fact that uh, times change and, and cost pressures and everything else changes. So the fact that we're able to, with those cost pressures and with the pressures that we have on the budget, do something that when we were young, when, when I was young, you paid for camp. We were able to make that free for everybody. Not everybody's swimming. We would love for everybody to swim. But not everybody's swimming, and what I know is that if you're if you want to swim and you can't afford to, we make we have scholarships available for people to come in. Am I telling the truth? If you can't afford to come yes, into the, the pools, do you get turned away? You get to come in. Um, so the the reality is we have to be good fiscal stewards of the uh, facilities that we have, and uh, times change. So while we've been able to make things more affordable or make them free uh, for the things that we know that everybody participates in with the summer camps. We also have to be uh, responsible in making sure that there's a small fee attached to using the swimming pool. And if you can't afford it, you're still welcome in. Um, so we're not taking away, we're actually providing more services than were provided when I was, uh, when I was a child. And when I first came on the council, that wasn't offered 
Uh, this is something that we were able to do because we've been good stewards of uh, the resources that we have. Um, and I do agree with you that our young people are our bright future and that's why we've worked very hard year after year or year over year to increase the amount of uh, dollars, city dollars that are going to out of school time, to youth programming, to recreation and parks, all of that has increased every single year, even in tough times because I agree uh, that our young people are the future and we should invest in them. With respect to the African American Festival, I'll go back to the same thing I said before. There's very little that was the same when we were growing up as it is now. And the African American Festival is the same. Um, in order for us to, to make sure that it was a destination, in order for us to make sure it was a premier event, we shortened it from three days to two. Um, the facts are the facts. The number of people who participated in the free festival increased every single year. And it's because we were reasonable about what we could afford to put on and make sure that what we did put on was the best. Some people would suggest that you should spread your resources like peanut butter and that's the best way to, um, to, to serve. Uh, we could have a, a B quality event by spreading the resources over three days, or we could continue to have a world-class event that's drawing people not just from the city, but all up and down the East Coast because we've concentrated the festival and made sure that the quality is maintained. And that's what we've done. And because we've done it, again, every single year we have better entertainment, we have more participation, and I think it, it speaks to the value we have that I place on the African American community and the heritage uh, that we have. Um, with respect to the participation of young people in marching bands, um, I'm not sure what outreach was done uh, to that community. I can say that there is a significant amount of outreach and participation for um, young people. There's a whole youth component to the African American Festival that is again, growing every single year. So I'm very proud of the work that we've been able to do. It's not gonna be the way that uh, it was when we were growing out. Uh, certainly, that being said, doesn't mean that it can't be better. And that's what I strive for. Any other questions? Come on up. Hello, how you doing? <clears throat> Thank you, um, Mayor Blake, for allowing me to speak this afternoon. My name is Yvonne Slater. I'm the RAB delegate for Section 8 Public Housing. And I'm coming on behalf of my community, which is the Parkwood community on West Baltimore. Um, just to give you a little briefing, I was raised up in Northwest Baltimore, and I went to Callaway Elementary School. We had to go across the track. And it was like five blocks. In on five blocks, I never seen a liquor store. I never seen anybody hanging out on corners. I raised my children up in Lafayette Courts Projects. And they attended City Springs Elementary. Once again, no liquor stores, no one hanging on the corners. They did have a bar, but that bar opened up late at night. Now I'm living up in Parkwood. The children see liquor stores open in the morning, they see liquor stores open in the afternoon. The same John Doe that st sit on the corner in the morning is there in the afternoon. And the area is filled with vacancy. What is we gonna do to better that community and other communities as such as that? So I've been a very strong advocate of reducing the concentration of liquor stores uh, in Baltimore City. Uh, unfor well, fortunately or unfortunately, I can't wave a wand and make that happen. It's a process. And while I've been very vocal, the process is in the hands of the city council right now. And there are some members of the city council who believe, like you do, that we need to take affirmative action to reduce the number of liquor stores. There are also some that think that there's nothing wrong with the number of liquor stores that we have in our community. Uh, I continue to fight. Uh, you know uh, that after the, the riots and the unrest, the, the, we spent a lot of time making sure that we supported businesses that were damaged. But one thing I did 
uh, was to say if those liquor stores, if there were liquor stores that were damaged, that were non-conforming, meaning that they were grandfathered in, um, that they would not be, uh, if, t if today someone wanted to go there and open a liquor store, they couldn't because it really is not a good fit for that community. I said that we're not going to put any of the city, city dollars into reopening that unless uh, the community agreed and the representatives from that community agreed that we should do that. I did that because I knew that the council was very slow to act on um, reducing the concentration of liquor stores in our community. So I would suggest to you uh, that you communicate your feelings with the city council president and the members of uh, the uh, city council who will be voting on the zoning uh, legislation because I think they, they need to hear from more residents that the concentration of liquor stores is unacceptable. Yeah, I rep I, on the, when I was on the city council, I represented Park Heights. And uh, we have two blocks in Park Heights that has the highest concentration of liquor stores in the city. And uh, there's absolutely no reason for, I think it's either, it, it's at least five, maybe more, in one block. There's no reason for that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we've been fighting to show uh, everyone um, and the, you know, particularly the council members, that there's a direct relationship between the concentration of liquor stores and a lot of the health disparities that we've been fighting. So uh, we're on the same page uh, that uh, that this is a problem. And my hope is that the city council members will hear from more people like you and feel compelled to act on uh, on your concerns and help to reduce the the number of liquor stores that we have uh, in the community because it is a problem. I can also say that we are looking for ways. You talked about liquor stores, but I know that you're also talking about corner stores that are uh, hotbeds of criminal activity. And I've asked my team, the police department, the health department, um, code enforcement, everyone to work together to come up with all of the tools that we have in our toolbox to address those uh, stores that are either turning a blind eye to the criminal activity or they're complicit. Either way, the community is hurt. So we're looking for the tools that we have so we can address those, uh, those operators that are really damaging uh, our community. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming out. Anybody else before we move on? Madam Mayor, if it's okay with you, I was going to ask for the Vice President, I'm sorry, the Vice Chair of the uh, Youth Commission uh, to come up and give brief remarks, Ms. Kelsey Johnson. And uh, no disrespect to the adults who have spoken, but it'll be good to hear from uh, some young people. <laughs> good evening, everyone. We thank you all for coming out tonight. My name is Kelsey Johnson. I'm the vice chair of the Baltimore City Youth Commission. Um, first, I want to thank the mayor, Madam Mayor, for being here, and thank you, Lieutenant Robert, Colonel Robertson for being here, standing in for Commissioner Davis. Um, I also want to give thanks to Chief Niles Ford for being here as well. Um, thank you for showing up. I know it's a late Wednesday evening and uh, you got better things to do. There's some TV that you might want to watch, but we thank you for being here and expressing your concerns about our youth. Um, thank you again and please uh, be as inquisitive as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. Madam Mayor. I, I, I'm just, uh, again, grateful for everyone that's come out. I know that uh, our focus was trying to get a lot of young people here, and the, the Youth Commission worked hard to, to make that happen. I'll stick around for a little bit if there, any of the Youth Commissioners have any questions for me. I want to thank the adults that are here, uh, especially the service providers, members of my administration who are giving some good information out. Uh, I want to thank members of my team. Did I miss anybody? No? Um, members, did you have a question, sweetie? Uh, yeah. Come on up. Um, my name is Tajay, and I have a question. Oh, Why are there more food deserts in, instead of markets in a city, like a lot of convenience stores in one areas instead of a healthy food market and stuff like that? 
So the question of why is a complicated uh, one, um, and it has a lot to do with the patterns of disinvestment in our city and cities across our country. Um, the food deserts in urban environments is, is uh, a problem that exists, and it's something that's very important to me. Baltimore City was the first uh, city in the country to hire a food policy director so we could address the issue of food deserts and access to fresh and healthy food in the city. We've been a leader in this issue around the country and really internationally. Um, I served as the vice chair of the U.S. Conference of Mayors Food Policy Task Force, and we put a lot of things in place to address that. We created the virtual supermarket, and that virtual supermarket makes it possible for people who live in food deserts to have access to fresh and healthy food and to be able to use their uh, EBT cards or their um, benefits in a way that um, that no, that most food retailers don't let them use. You, uh, while you can pay for your food, if you were um, buying from Peapod or from one of the other supermarkets that have delivery services, you could use a credit card or debit card, but you can't use your EBT. Well, with the virtual supermarket, we created a program that allows individuals who are using, that are paying with EBT, to have that same convenience of a food delivery service. And it's a program that's very innovative and that's been replicated by cities around the country. We've also looked for ways to connect the urban agriculture community with our corner stores so we can get more fresh uh, fruits and vegetables into our corner stores, making those connections and uh, make it more readily available. We've also expanded the number of uh, farmers markets in uh, the city under my administration. We've expanded, I think, almost double the size of the, the, the largest uh, farmer's market, the one on Sundays under 83, has expanded dramatically under my administration. And we've created, we've uh, supported the creation of more farmer's markets throughout the city. And at the same time, we're making it easier for individuals who have, uh, who are, um, who have subsidies that are paying with EBT and other uh, subsidies to use those farmers markets. We, in in many of our farmers markets, we double the um, your money. So if you're paying with uh, EBT, um, up to $10 will double that money that makes it easier for you to, uh, to, to buy more uh, fresh fruit and more uh, produce. Uh, we know that uh, health disparities that we see in our city are directly linked to the access to uh, healthy food in your community. If you have, if your if your only access is to uh, food that um, either causes you to be obese, to have high blood pressure, um, to have high cholesterol, then you put yourself at risk for heart disease, for high blood pressure, for stroke, for diabetes. And we're working very hard to correct the environment so we can um, we can level out the, the, uh, the playing field when it comes to life expectancy and, and health disparities. So the food deserts are a real problem. And while we're working, I just have a, a um, I just introduced a, also a, t a tax credit that would encourage um, grocers to move into food deserts and give them a, <coughs> excuse me, a significant tax break if they, locate their store in a food desert. So we have a lot of things going on to combat the, the issue of food deserts so we can bring um, better access to uh, fresh um, quality and affordable food in more of our communities. Okay. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jordan Brown, and I wanted to know if there was a way to increase the quality of school lunches, um, just food in general, because I don't think they're necessarily that healthy. Like, we get fruit and salad and things like that, but it's like, it doesn't seem like it's working really well. Like, I can see they're trying, but... And I appreciate the fact that you you can see that they're trying because I have to commend uh, Dr. Thornton and the the school district for working to improve the quality of food uh, that's offered in schools. I will say that we know that uh, yes, that work has been done, but there's a long way to go. 
uh, and uh, for the young people to be fully satisfied with the options that they have. I'm very pleased that they've offered, they've uh, added fresh and healthy food to every lunch. I'm also very proud that we're one of a handful of cities around the country that have community eligibility, which means that uh, you don't have to fill, the families don't have to fill out the, the cumbersome uh, paperwork in order to qualify for free lunch that everyone is, uh, has access to uh, breakfast and free lunch uh, in schools. Um, but I will, I, I can say that, you know, I have team members who are here that uh, I will convey your concern to the school system and I know that they will as well. And, um, and I would encourage you, the school, um, the school board has a student representative and I would also encourage you to share your concern with that, with the rep who has a direct connection to uh, the uh, school board as well as the leadership of the, um, of the school system. Now you didn't start at something. <laughs> Do we have any other young people that want to ask a question before we close up? So again, uh, I want to thank you for coming out again. I thank the adults for being here, especially the service providers that are talking about the, the different uh, programs that are available for our young people. I'm always looking for ways that we can get more information out and and share the information about the different things that we have available. I want to thank our youth commissioners. I want to thank our uh, lieutenant colonel. Am I giving you the right title? All right, uh, for for being here again. I want to thank the. Uh, um, I'm not going to call you your nickname. That's why I'm trying to get your title right. That's your government name, Osborne. Do I use that, <laughs> lieutenant governor? He, he, I'm just saying. I'll, I'll say, Lieutenant Colonel, thank you very much for being here and for all of you. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the next time we have an opportunity to, uh, to convene. And hopefully we won't be double and triple booked and we'll be able to have more young people here. So again, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.